Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Welcome to church. Welcome to GVBC Second Service. We're going to start in just a minute. And so if you would mind, just would you stand up and greet and hug and handshake and all that to some people around you, and then we'll begin. All right, uh, let's slowly make our way back to our seats. Uh, uh, you can remain standing. We're going to enter into a time of worship together as a church family. Uh, again, I'm Pastor James. If I haven't met you, it's so good to be in worship with you together. Uh, hear the word of the Lord as I start us off with our call to worship, uh, which comes from Galatians 2.20, and it says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, uh, as we come before you in your presence this moment, um, we're, we're thankful that, God, it is not just us here, but, Lord, it is your work, your very life at work within each and every one of us. That is what we celebrate. That is what we see in one another. Um, and that is what graciously sustains us and has sustained us all of our lives. God, you are so faithful to us. You are so good to us. And God, we come before you now just with hearts of just gratitude and thankfulness for the life that we live in you and the life that you live within each and every one of us. God, it uh, just continues to amaze us, Lord, that miracle. Um, so, Lord, as we worship you this moment, I pray, Lord, that we would worship you with eyes fully open, Lord, to your goodness at work, alive in each of our hearts. May you be praised and glorified in our midst. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. May we sing joyfully to the God of our salvation. Sing together, holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. and mighty God in three persons and blessed trinity Sing holy, holy, holy holy, holy holy and all saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Darkness. 
to trust Him more. I'm so glad. And I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me and will be with me to the end. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, and how I prove Him more and more. And Jesus, Jesus, and precious Jesus, and oh, for grace to join. Last time, let's sing Jesus together. Hey, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, and how I've proved Him more and more. And Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Lord, we thank you for this morning that you have allowed for us as broken, sinful people to come into your presence with thanksgiving and with joy. We thank you for transforming our lives and allowing us to be able to even trust you in the first place, Lord. For you know our old self, that it longs for the ways of the world, it longs for anything except for Christ. But Lord, we thank you that you have transformed and changed our lives to help us to love you and to know you and to follow you and to trust you as well. We pray for every single aspect of this service today as we sing, as we hear your word, as we have communion with one another, that it would be a reminder of the body that you have placed with us for the local church, for our encouragement, and Lord, for all things that it would be for your glory and not for our own. So we thank you for the time that we are able to encourage one another through singing. Would you convict our hearts and help us to turn towards you as we hear your word, to turn from our sin and say to turn to our Savior. And so we thank you for the reminder that we have with one another. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, GVBC. I'm Brendan. And I'm Daniel. And we're here to bring you in this morning's announcements. First, the American Baptist Historical Society is creating a digital collection of records that document the experience of Japanese Americans during World War II and the Ministry of Northern Baptist to assist interns. You can participate by sharing your family documents by bringing them to Community Scanning Days late in June. For more information, be sure to attend the meeting on April 21st from 10.15 to 10.45 a.m. between services in room 201. Next, we're excited to announce two new Zoom courses starting the week of April 15th for GVBC men and women. For GVBC men and women, we have Knowing God, an eight-week Zoom course offered Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. or Fridays at noon. For GVBC men only, we have Spirit Walk, an eight-week Zoom course offered Wednesdays at 6 a.m. or Thursdays at 7 p.m. For more information, visit gvbc.net slash new events. Lastly, the next Disciple Makers Boot Camp, led by Pastor Tien, is coming up on April 20th. For more information, visit our website. That's all we have for announcements. And we'll see you back in service. Bye. Bye. All right, thank you, Brendan and Daniel, for that. Uh, again, I'm Pastor James, if I haven't met you, and it's uh, good to be here and worship with you. If you are a newcomer, and uh, this is your first time, or you just, uh, the first couple times that you've been out, we're really glad that you're here and worship with us this morning. Um, if you get a chance, we'd love for you to stop by our Connect Center, which was right in the middle table on your way in. And we, we uh, are just really glad that you're here. We have a special uh, gift for you there, and we'd love to get you one, so be sure to pick one up. Uh, on your way out. Um, 
Hey, as we uh, continue in worship, there's a couple, just one more announcement for you guys. Some of you may know the Hara family here, Craig and Tina, um, and their children, Cami and Courtney Hara. Um, they uh, lost Clarence Hara, who is Craig's dad. Um, and that was actually back in January 30th, uh, 2021, um, which was in the middle of COVID. So they had to keep pushing back uh, the memorial service. Um, and so they pushed it back all the way till now, which is several years later, um, on Saturday, April 13th. It's coming up Saturday, April 13th, 2024 uh, uh, at 1030 a.m. with lunch to follow. It's here at GVBC. Um, they do ask that you kindly RSVP uh, to their phone number 310-324-1197 and it's Aloha Tire. Um, because it's been pushed back so, so much, actually this would be Clarence's 100th birthday. Um, so actually, it's a 100th birthday celebration. So happy birthday to Clarence. And um, uh, for all of us that, um, whether you're planning to attend or not, please be keeping the Hara family in your prayers. Uh, we are going to move into a time of offering and prayer together as a church. Uh, as always, offering is available online and also at the station uh, and stations around the church in the back and around. Um, we're grateful for your generous and faithful giving to all the ministries here uh, through GVBC. Um, as we enter into a time of prayer, uh, each Sunday we have this integrated corporate prayer together as a church family. Uh, we cover different aspects of the church. Uh, this morning we're going to do a, a little more liturgical prayer of confession together, and that's in view of us taking communion a little bit later in service. Uh, for that, on screen you're going to see um, a corporate prayer of confession, which in part I'll read a part of it, and then you'll see a part in the yellow that Joe read together as a church family family. Um, so let's uh, pray together uh, for those things, church. This uh, corporate prayer of confession comes from 2 Corinthians 3.18, which says this, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so Heavenly Father, draw us into your glorious presence this moment. How easily we are captivated by worldly pleasures and pursuits that draw us away from you, congregation. You alone are the highest treasure of our hearts. Jesus, thank you for taking our place upon the cross and dying a death we deserve so that we can stand today forgiven, free, and reconciled back to you. Together now. There is no greater love we have received. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you into our lives to heal our wounds, to love our brokenness, to convict us of our sin, and to restore us anew. We cannot transform ourselves, but we can connect our hearts to yours together now. Help us to remain steadfast to you. And so, Heavenly Father, this moment and this day, as we take communion together as a church family, I pray, Lord, that we would do so, Lord, not out of, out of ritual or out of routine. I pray that this service would not be out of ritual or routine, but that this really would be a moment, Lord, that we would commune with our Savior and our first love, that there would be a precious way within our souls and our spirits that personally draws closer to your presence here in this place. So Holy Spirit, would you come and would you fill our hearts anew so that we would know, Lord, that in this life, Lord, it's, it's not about just us trying to make something of ourselves, but Lord, it is us drawing closer to our Creator, our Heavenly Father, the one who made us and saved us and loves us this moment. And I pray, Lord, that in your presence, we would experience such a renewing transformation. In your presence, we would know, Lord, such a depth of our Father's love. In your presence, we would be able to connect back once again to our original purpose in life, one that comes from you, one that is driven by you. And so, Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, that we can experience your presence here as a church family together. God, we do pray, Lord, for the Hara family as well, Lord, as they prepare for Clarence's service, that, Lord, you would be in their hearts, you would be their comfort, you would be their healing, uh, you would uh, allow them to be able to lift up Clarence to you, to your hands of mercy and to your hands of grace, and that there, there would be comfort there. Uh, there would be a connection to their Heavenly Father there. There would be a knowing, Lord, that uh, you hold all their lives in your hands. And Heavenly Father, I, I pray that we as a church family would know how to walk with them 
through this time. So God, um, as we continue in your word, um, Lord, would this time just be a, a precious way that we would receive your word into our hearts, that we would hear your word in our ears from your very spirit speaking to us, transforming us, changing us into your likeness. God, we cannot do this without you, and so we pray that you would draw close and we would draw close to you this moment. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Daniel, if I haven't met you. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And um, those of you online, welcome as well. Uh, last week we had a wonderful Easter service, and so praise God. I, I hope that if you're new here, you feel welcomed and loved by God and by, by us. I just want to mention too, to, uh, in case you're not aware, I'm going to be going to Brazil in a week. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be going with Jerry Shiozaki. The two of us are going to go to see our mission partners over there, uh, Phil and Kareen Smith, that run um, you know, the outreach for the uh, street children in Brazil. And so we're going to be visiting Hope Mountain and um, some of the places over there. So if you would just be praying for us, we'll be leaving um, a week from tomorrow. So not, I'll be here next Sunday. The day after that, we'll be leaving for one week from the 15th to the 22nd. So you can just be praying for us as we get ready for that. So this isn't the mission trip with everyone else. It's just going to be uh, kind of a vision trip for me as the senior pastor with Jerry's help to be able to see the work that they're doing over in Brazil. So... I have a jasmine vine on my porch at home. And up until recently, it would wind its way up a trellis from our driveway to the roof. And, um, you know, every few months, the tendrils would grow out of control. If you've ever had a jasmine plant, you know what that's like. And um, I'd, when I cut back the, the vine, uh, it's amazing because within a couple months, there it is again. Right, it's overgrowing, it's just kind of spreading all over the, um, the top. And so when I'd cut the vine, I'd have to make sure that I, um, I didn't cut the main part of, of the vine, right? O only the tendrils that are out of control. Because wherever I, I choose to make that cut, fr from that point on, the, the branch, you know, it, it's cut off. And so it, it dies from that point on. So I have to be careful. I can't just cut it anywhere. And, uh, you know, obviously the branch can, can no longer grow once it's been been severed, it, it it doesn't if it doesn't stay connected to the vine, it doesn't grow anymore. And uh, I remember one time we had our house fumigated for for termites, and the uh, jasmine vine was inside of the fumigation area, and so the whole thing turned um, turned brown and looked completely dried and and withered up, and it, it didn't look any more like the way that a jasmine um, vine should look. And there have been Many times in my life where I have felt dried and withered inside like a dead jasmine branch. When my son Joshua was young, I, I began teaching him piano. And it was a good way to um, save money on music lessons while at the same time teaching him something that I love to do myself. Um, but as the years went by, and as the pieces got harder, my expectations rose of what Joshua should be capable of. And there were times when my frustration would spill out, when he continued to hit the wrong notes in a difficult part of the piece. And I would correct him with a very exasperated tone of voice. And it would discourage him, and there would be times where he would start crying. And instead of God's love flowing through me to Joshua, my anger was flowing because I was acting out of, um, out of my impatience, uh, out of my need for him to get it right, and in a sense, maybe thereby proving my worth as his teacher somehow in there. And instead of drawing upon God's compassion and his patience and letting Joshua practice on his own and kind of, you know, kind of getting it, um, learning it the way that he could, I, I was acting in my flesh and I was demanding, you know, immediate perfection in a sense. And so in those angry moments, I was completely 
disconnected from God's love and from Jesus. And that's why my heart dried up and I was no longer able to have the self-control to love Joshua as I should. I'm wondering if any of you have ever felt dried and withered up inside, kind of like that dead jasmine branch. Maybe some of you feel that way right now. Uh, maybe you struggle with a particular sin that keeps tripping you up. Uh, or maybe a broken relationship. Or it's just a set of very difficult circumstances. But whatever it is, it's had a huge impact on your spiritual health. And you know you're not where God wants you to be right now. Maybe you've even been coming to church. You, you, you've been reading your Bible. Uh, so on the outside, everything looks okay, but you still feel dried and withered inside. You feel far from God. My prayer is that today, today's message will be encouraging to you. Um, we're, we're continuing our sermon series through the Gospel of John called, Do You Love Me? And, and today we'll be looking at John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. And we're going to uh, see how vital it is for us to stay connected to the vine. Jesus is in the middle of this very important conversation with his closest followers. And it, it's a section called the Upper Room uh, Discourse. On, on the very night that he's going to be betrayed and arrested. And in John 15, Jesus is painting this beautiful picture of what our relationship with him should look like. And so here's the main point that I'd like for us to see in today's passage. We were created to live daily in a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus that we might bear fruit and bring glory to God. And I love that. You know, there are, because there are many people in this world who think differently, who think that the main goal of life is to get a good job and move up the corporate ladder and earn a lot of money so that you can have a comfortable retirement. Others think that the main goal of life is maintaining this healthy, long life. And, you know, to do that, you exercise and you eat well. And, and, and that's what it means to, to really live life the way that we should. You know, still others think the goal of life is maximizing your, your personal happiness by, by going out with, with friends and by pursuing, you know, your favorite interests and by traveling the world and, and so on. But today's passage in John 15 teaches us that we are created to live daily in a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. That we might bear fruit and bring glory to God. And if we're doing anything else other than that, we're going to discover that something is missing. Something's not right. And we're going to dry up inside. Our number one goal, we need to stay connected to the vine. We need to stay connected to the vine. That's what today's about. So in verses 1 to 3, Jesus introduces the primary illustration of the vine and the branches. And he says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And so the first thing we see right off the bat is Jesus is the true vine. Jesus is the true vine. Now in the Old Testament, the symbol of the vine often, was often used to describe the nation of Israel, but in a negative sense. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, it, it speaks of Israel as a, as a vine that only yielded bad fruit. It only yielded bad fruit, and it was a vine headed for destruction. And so Jesus here, is, he's saying, unlike the unfruitful vine of the past, I am the true vine. And my heavenly father is the gardener who tends the vine. And if you want to have a genuine relationship with God, 
It's not going to automatically happen based on your national origin or your church affiliation or anything else. No, you need to be deeply rooted in me. I am the true vine. And then Jesus goes on to talk about two kinds of branches. So branch number one is a branch that bears no fruit. What happens to that branch? Well, it is cut off by the gardener. That branch is cut off. If a branch does not bear fruit over time, it means, it demonstrates that it doesn't have a proper connection to the vine. So branch number one represents unbelievers who may attend church on Sundays and even say that they believe in Jesus, but over time there's no fruit. There's no fruit producing in their lives, and so they're, they're, they're cut off meaning that they experience God's eternal judgment for their sin. Branch two, on the other hand, is a branch that bears fruit. And it represents genuine believers who trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. Their old self died with Christ. And they have been raised with Christ and set free from the penalty and the power of sin. And now God's love flows in them and through them to, to other people. And this branch bears fruit. And then it's pruned by the gardener so that it can bear more fruit. What is fruit? The, the fruit that's being talked about in this passage. Well, fruit is what is produced when the, the branches are staying connected to the vine. So when the branches are staying connected to the vine, you have what the Bible is describing here as fruit. When believers live daily in this deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. And so fruit can include Christ-like character on the inside. Christ-like character on the inside. So in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, many of you know this verse, this is the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul, he, he states that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so if we've truly given our lives to Jesus, then these are the kinds of examples of the kinds of character qualities that are being formed in us, inside. Fruit can also include Christ-like actions on the outside. So there's Christ-like character on the inside and Christ-like actions on the outside. And in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, this is just one example, but Paul points to actions like forgiving one another, um, like letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. He, he talks about teaching and admonishing one another. And so if we've truly given our lives to Jesus, then these are the actions and responses that naturally flow out of our lives to others. And then, finally, what is pruning? Talks about pruning. Pruning is when the gardener selectively removes any diseased or dead wood from the branch, right? Anything that's hindering healthy growth. So Pastor James, this past week, he told me as I was preparing for this message that he's trying to prune some of his own trees at home. And he's learning that there's kind of an art to, to prune. You don't just kind of cut wherever, right? There's an art to this. And this past week, I watched this YouTube video of this master gardener. And he talks about four different kinds of pruning cuts. Okay, so I won't go into tremendous detail, but the, the, there's a heading cut, there's a thinning cut, there's a re-leadering cut, and there's a jump cut. And each cut has a different purpose in, in helping the tree to become healthier and stronger. And so spiritually speaking, God will sometimes use painful or very difficult situations or messy relationships or difficult circumstances, difficult seasons of life even, in order to remove areas of our character that don't belong, to cause us to reevaluate maybe some of our priorities, to, to shape our faith and our trust in Him. God's pruning takes place when I deny myself and take up my cross. 
So a lot of times when God's pruning takes place in our lives is when I need to deny myself and take up my cross and follow him, right? Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Giving some examples of pruning situations. Um, let's say someone has hurt me and I don't want to forgive that person, but I deny myself, I die to my old self, and I pray for change in my heart. I pray that God would heal my heart. I even begin to pray for that other person. And as I die to my old self, God brings about his resurrection power in my life. And he enables me to put on my new self. And he helps me to release that anger and bitterness that I'm, I'm carrying around toward that person. And I can not only forgive that person, but take steps to move toward reconciliation and healing. Here's another example. Maybe I'm, I'm going through one bad situation after another. You ever had that when it just seems like it's snowballing with bad things happening? And it feels like God has abandoned me. And I'm, 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 I'm getting frustrated and it's just painful. And... It's hard to maybe even pray or, or come to church because I'm angry at God during the season. But, but then I deny myself. I, I die to my old self. And I come before God every morning through the tears, through the pain. And even though I don't know all that tomorrow will bring, I just have to trust and come before God knowing that he's walking with me and he is guiding me and he is loving me today. You know, God's pruning process can be very uncomfortable, even painful. But I can take joy in the fact that God knows what he's doing, that he does all things for my good. Now, James 1, 2 to 4, what a wonderful passage. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so God's pruning takes place when I deny myself and take up my cross, trusting that, that God is in the process of shaping my character so that I can be mature and complete and bear even more fruit than I did before. And so if, if Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches that God wants to prune so we can be more fruitful, then here's the big question. Why should we stay connected to the vine? Why? Why should we stay connected to the vine? And there are two main reasons that I'd like to point out. First, when we stay connected to Jesus, we fulfill our life purpose and bear fruit. We fulfill our life purpose and bear fruit. Let me read verses 4 to 5. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so Jesus is saying that, that if we remain in him, he will also remain in us. In other words, our relationship with Jesus isn't just one-sided, right? It's mutual. As we seek to stay connected to him, he also desires to stay connected with us. Remember that main point that we saw a little bit earlier? We were created to live daily in a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus that we might bear fruit and bring glory to God. And so the more deeply we're drawing near to Jesus, then the more satisfied we are in life because we're fulfilling our life purpose, the very reason why we were created. But you know, the opposite is also true, right? Getting back to that 
slide from before, when we don't stay connected to Jesus, then we don't fulfill our life purpose and we don't bear fruit. And Jesus emphasizes this many times. I've highlighted in yellow um, the parts in this verse. He, Jesus says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. He says, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then he says at the bottom, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we can keep a very busy schedule and do things that may look like good fruit on the outside, but if we're not deeply connected to, to Jesus, then those things are not going to bring about things that last for eternity. They're, they're, they're not going to bring glory to God. And I wonder how many of us are, are feeling dry and withered inside. And the primary reason we're feeling that way is not because our circumstances have been difficult lately, but because we've been running around trying to produce fruit in our own strength. We're trying hard to produce fruit, but we've lost connection with the vine. And Jesus today is calling out to us, and he's saying, you can't bear fruit unless you are deeply connected with me. Working harder and harder, that's not the answer. I'm the only one who can fill you up. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so why should we stay connected to the vine? Number one, we fulfill our life purpose and bear fruit. Second, we become aligned with God's will and glorify him. We become aligned with God's will and glorify him. Verses 6 to 8. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Wow, there, you know, there's a severe consequence for those who reject Jesus and refuse to remain in him. It says that they're thrown into the fire and burned. They, they experience God's eternal judgment in hell. But when you choose to remain in him so closely and so intimately, that his words remain in you, then your, then your heart and, and God's heart, it's like they become more and more aligned. Like your heart, God's heart, it just becomes closer and closer until they're in perfect alignment with one another. And you begin to have a clearer sense of what God wants. And, and you're like, you know what? I want that same thing. I want what God wants. And so then when you pray, it's almost like your, your prayers go up to God and not, he not only hears them, but he answers them right away because it's like your will is already in alignment with God's will. And you're just doing what God is already doing. You know, have you ever been driving down the street and you, you, know, you kind of realize, oh man, my car is kind of veering a little bit to one side. And so you kind of like, you know, take your hands off the steering wheel for a few seconds and yeah, sure enough, you know, it's starting to kind of drift over, right? And so um, that's when you, you know that you need to take the car in to get an alignment, right? If you don't, not only will your car continue to veer in, in that wrong direction, but your tires are eventually going to, to unevenly wear um, uh, over time. And in the same way, the bumps of, of everyday life uh, are going to throw you out of spiritual alignment. It's, it's going to happen. And you may not even notice that you're beginning to kind of veer off course. And it's causing wear and tear on, on your patience and on your love for others and, and on your joy in life. But as you get reconnected to the vine, it's almost like God gives you this, this re, spiritual realignment. And, and his words are, are remaining in, in you and his truth begins to transform your perspective. And instead of focusing just on what you need, you begin to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if you're in alignment with God's will, and if 
I'm in alignment with God's will, and if all of us are in alignment with God's will, it's, it's powerful. Because then we will bear much fruit for his kingdom. Not just individually, but as a church. We glorify him as we prove to the world, this is at the bottom, that we are his disciples. We glorify him. You know, staying connected to the vine is at the very, very center of our GVBC vision. That's what we want to be as a church. And I want to come back to this again and again because we need to know this is what we're about. This is what Gardena Valley Baptist Church is about. That in order for us to be spiritually healthy, it's not going to come from working hard to have an amazing worship team or powerful messages or just great programs that are well attended. I mean, those things are all nice. But what we want is we want to have more and more people who are living consistently in the center circle. That's what we're about. That's what's going to make us grow. If we get that right, everything else will take care of itself. More and more of us that are living consistently in the center circle. I believe that we were created to live daily in a deep, intimate relationship with the person of Christ. And our main goal is passionately pursuing Jesus in that center circle. Not just on Sunday mornings when we're here together, but every single day of the week as we praise him for who he is and for what he has done, as we speak to him and as we listen for his voice and as we bring our needs before him and as we trust him with the things that are beyond our control. And as we stay connected to the vine, as we live consistently in that center circle, you know what happens? It's like the love of God is just pouring into our hearts and it begins to overflow. It begins to overflow not, and out, it goes out to others in the body of Christ. It just overflows into that second circle. And we begin humbly and sacrificially loving one another. And sometimes, you know, as we have a church body and we have ministries and we serve with one another, then issues come up, right? We're, we disagree with one another. We, we hurt one another. We, we let our differences keep us at a distance from one another. Those things will come up in the church. But as we stay connected to the vine, God prunes us. And he makes just the right cut at the right moment. And we learn even more deeply what it means and what it looks like. To humbly and sacrificially love one another. And as we stay connected to the vine. And as we continue to live consistently in that center circle. And the love of God continues to pour into our hearts. And it overflows out into the body of Christ. And then overflows outside of that into the third circle. As we begin to do the work of Christ. And we begin intentionally making disciples. And we fulfill the great commission. We don't have to work at it because it's just flowing outward. It's just naturally pouring out of us. And we're ministering to the needs of not just people in our church, but people in our local community and around the world. We make a difference. We impact the world around us. And through the ups and downs of the challenges that we face in, in ministry and in our broken society, God continues to, to prune us. And we bear more and more and more fruit for his glory as we become the light of the world. And this, this is our GVBC vision. And it begins right here in John 15 as we stay connected to the vine. It's all about staying connected to the vine. But as we know, this is easier said than done, right? And so the final question we need to look at is this. How do we stay connected to the vine? What are some practical ways that we can actually do this? Well, number one, we can cultivate spiritual habits. We can cultivate spiritual habits. 
You know, Pastor Tian is going to be able to cover more on spiritual habits at his, you heard earlier about his Disciple Makers Boot Camp on Saturday, uh, April 20th, if you're able to make it. So he'll talk more about that. But a habit, in short, is simply um, a learned behavior that you repeat consistently until it becomes almost involuntary. When you were young, your parents taught you to brush your teeth. And as you got older, they had to remind you when you are a kid, right? Just every meal, brush your teeth. Hopefully by now, you know, you do it and you don't have to think about it, right? You just do it. It's something that you, you it's become a habit. An example of a spiritual habit is waking up in the morning and before you do anything else, one of the first things you do is you spend time, you have a personal time with God. You have a personal time with Jesus. And you start by praising him for who he is and his finished work on the cross. Maybe you read some scriptures that affirm your, who you are in him, that you're fully loved and accepted and you're, um, you're, you're loved by him. You, you know, you, you're a child of God. And you just take a chunk of time just to sit in his truth and, and soak in it. And then you review your schedule, maybe, with, with, with Jesus. You, you take a look at what you're going to do during the coming day, and you just kind of talk to God about it. You talk to Jesus, and you say, you know what? Is there anything you want to tell me about it? Is there anything you want to change? And you listen for his voice. And then maybe you just close with a time of prayer, and you, know, you lift up any concerns that you have about family or work or finances or health or, or anything else for that matter. That can be a spiritual habit. And what's important to realize is that a spiritual habit isn't just about checking off a box. You know, like, I had my time with God this morning, check. It's, it's far deeper than that, right? It's about establishing sacred rhythms in your life that enable you to actually encounter the person of Jesus Christ more consistently over time. You know, many of you have been reading through the New Testament with us as a church body, right? We're doing that together. Um, we're, we started at the end of August, last August, and we're going to finish by the end of this August, one year. And my prayer is that for more and more of you, as you've been doing this, it's become not just about Bible reading, reading through the Bible, checking off the box, right? My prayer is that for many of you, it's become a sacred rhythm that is helping you to stay connected to the vine as you remain in him and his words remain in you. You know, many of you took part in the 50 days of prayer that we had, right? In the 50 days leading up to Easter. We just finished that this past Sunday. And my prayer is that while it may have started as a seven-week program that, you know, took you out of your comfort zone to just come and attend, it might have started that way, but it hopefully became a sacred rhythm of prayer that helped you and me and our church to stay connected to the vine as we prayed for one another and with one another during those 50 days. And some of you may have other sacred rhythms that work for you. For some of you, it might be times of solitude where you just need to get away and carve out extended time to encounter Jesus. For others of you, maybe it's keeping a detailed prayer journal. Whatever it is, we can stay connected to the vine as we cultivate spiritual habits. Number two, we can confess spiritual distractions. We can confess spiritual distractions. You know, examples of things that um, might distract you from deepening your intimacy with Jesus might be like a stubborn sin that keeps tripping you up. Uh, maybe it's a difficult relationship that's giving you a lot of grief right now. Maybe it's uh, a busy schedule that just seems packed from morning until night. There are so many things in life that can become spiritual distractions. Things that keep you from, from staying connected to the vine. Things that keep you from bearing fruit. And I want to focus right now on one specific distraction that I think affects many of us here at GBC. You know, those of you who use social media, uh, you know how tempting it is to compare yourself with others 
when you look at the things they post, people put the best of themselves out there. And it's hard to know what's real and what's not. And so when you look at other people's lives, it always seems like everyone's doing better than you. Right? They seem to have more friends, more money, more success, more happiness. And it leaves you kind of feeling discouraged. Maybe like I'm all alone. So you think to yourself, you know, okay, and then, and then you go to church. And then it's the same thing, right? You, you come to church and everyone seems like they're a better Christian than you. They seem to have more knowledge of the Bible. They lift up better prayers. They seem to have a healthier marriage and family life than you do. They, they, they teach or lead more effectively than you do. And, and again, you end up feeling discouraged. You're just like, I just don't measure up to other people at my church. And so you think to yourself, I need to step up my game. I, I, need, to, I need to work harder. And so you, you do, you work harder and you try to be more faithful in that third circle of the work of Christ. And you say yes to, do, to doing more things even though you're already overloaded. You're trying so hard to, to bear fruit but no matter how hard you, you grunt and how you grind, that fruit isn't coming about and, and you're just left feeling dry and withered inside. Let me ask you, do, do some of you need to confess that, that, that sin of, of envy? That envying other brothers and sisters in our church family? And that envy is just pressuring you to just step it up and keep up. Or maybe for some of you, is it confessing that sin of, of, of pride? It's compelling you just to work hard because you're trying to maintain this, this reputation of faithfulness. People know you for being faithful and you've got to maintain that image. And so there's this pride that even though you're spiritually empty and things aren't going well, but you can't let people know that. And so you just have this thing where your pride keeps you going. You know, Jesus is saying to some of us this morning, Stop trying to do more. In fact, do less. Just focus on staying connected to me. You, you can't bear fruit unless you remain in me. Cultivate one spiritual habit and do that consistently. And over time, the fruit is going to automatically happen. It, 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 you don't have to work at it. You don't have to stress at it. It's going to happen if you're connected to me. Let me ask you, what do you need to confess today? We can stay connected to the vine as we confess spiritual distractions. And number three, we can commit to spiritual alignment. We can commit to spiritual alignment. And remember that remaining is a two-way street. Right? I remain in Christ and, and Christ remains in in me. And one way to think about God remaining, or Christ remaining in, in me, is that he works in me, and he works through me every single day as I, as I go about my daily life. And so, one practical way that I can commit to spiritual alignment is by saying short prayers throughout the day, every day, to acknowledge that Christ is present with me. So, for example, when I go to work or school in the morning, I, I say, Jesus, thank you that you're here with me now. Thank you that you're guiding me throughout my day today. And then I have a mid-morning me mid meeting with a, with a friend. And I say, Jesus, um, help me to be a blessing and an encouragement to that friend that I'm meeting in a few minutes. And then you have an uh, afternoon doctor's appointment. And you say, Jesus, my health is in your hands. Give me peace about the test results, whatever they may be. And then, you know, you come across a different, a, a difficult coworker or a family member, and you say, you know, Jesus, give me your patience. 
Help me to, to, to die to myself and honor you in the way that I speak to this person. You have an evening meeting at church, and again, you, you touch base and you say, hey, Jesus, be with me. Give us wisdom as we talk about these different things and, and help us to be unified in the way we go about, you know, this meeting today. And then, you know, before you go to sleep, you, you just say, Jesus, thank you for your presence with me today. Help me to get rest so that tomorrow, again, I can check in with you and partner with you tomorrow. You know, just short prayers throughout the day that remind us that we can't do anything apart from him. We can stay connected to the vine as we commit to spiritual alignment. You know, some of you are feeling spiritually healthy right now. You're, you're excited about God and you're bearing fruit. Awesome. Others of you, you're feeling dried and withered like that dead jasmine branch. And maybe it's even a struggle for you to be here today. Wherever you are spiritually, I hope you have been encouraged by this beautiful passage in John 15. Remember this. We were created to live daily in a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus that we might bear fruit and bring glory to God. And so in all that we do this week, may we as a church body stay connected to the vine. Let me pray for us. Thank you, God, for this awesome passage in John 15, for these intimate words that you gave to your disciples that now get passed on to, to us as your disciples, Lord, that remind us that we can't do anything apart from being connected, staying connected to the vine. God, we get so distracted. There, there are things that get in the way. There are things, Lord, that we need to confess before you today. But we thank you, Lord, that when we come to you and we come before you, you forgive us. You love us. You died for us that we might be able to have an intimate, daily, deep relationship with the God who created us and died for us and rose for us. Lord, as we move into a time of communion, we thank you for your death on the cross and what that signifies for us. We praise and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, before we go into a song of reflection, uh, we're going to pass out the elements in just a moment. And um, I'm just going to read this passage um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So hear these words from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and following. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And so we're going to be passing out the elements. And it's just a little, um, you know, the, the elements where there's a couple of tabs. There's a tab for the, the, um, the bread and a tab for the juice. And you can just hold on to it. We're going to take it together once it's been passed out and once the song has ended. But as you reflect during this time, I'd like you to just consider, especially that, that second response, that is there something to confess? Is there something that has been a distraction? It could be envy. It could be pride. It could be something else. But is there something that you need to really release to him and say, Lord, this has been keeping me from staying connected to the vine. And just allow this time, you know, you can sing, you could also be quiet, you could just reflect. Use this time to just consider the great, great love of Christ for you. And then at the end of the song, I'll come back up and we'll 
take it reflectively together. Okay? If you're new to the church, if you believe in Jesus, you're welcome to take communion elements with us. Um, if, if you don't know Jesus yet, you're just learning, I would say just be, be okay. Just let, let the thing pass and don't take it this time. But this is something that's meaningful for us who do believe, put our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is something that we do to remember his death on the cross for us. And so um, um, we're going to enter in time of worship. Again, reflect, hold that, I'll come back up and we'll, we'll take it together. Blood of Jesus. 
Let's go ahead and take the first tab off and just hold the bread. But before we take it together, let's just hold on to it for a moment. And as we look at this, this represents the body of Jesus Christ who died on the cross, taking upon himself the penalty of death, spiritual death that, that we deserved. And he did that willingly in order to make it possible for us to have a connection to the vine so that we could be grafted in and have the ability to directly come before God ourselves. How amazing is that? We do this each month, but let's not lose sight of the significance of what we're doing right now as we take and eat to remember him. Let's take and eat together. Let's remove that second tab for the juice. And again, as we prepare to take this, as we hold this and look at what this is, it, this, this juice represents the blood of, of Jesus that was poured out so that we wouldn't have to die an eternal death. That we wouldn't have to be thrown away and burned as branches but that we could be pruned so that we might bear fruit. How amazing that Jesus would leave his place in heaven and come down to earth and humble himself. How amazing is it that we could have a relationship with the living God. And so as we drink this, let's remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. Let's drink together. Let me pray for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are the true vine. We're reminded today that we cannot do anything apart from you. We need to stop trying to grind out fruit in our own strength. Thank you that when we remain in you, fruit just comes. It's just a matter of time. Lord, as we worship you, these, these final songs, may we give you our hearts. May we give you the praise that you deserve. May we glorify you with our heart and our soul. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. And to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Jesus, and for my life is wholly bound to His. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. The night is dark. But I am not forsaken, for by my side, the Savior, He will stay. And I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, His power is displayed. And to this I hold, who oh, my shepherd will defend me. And through the deep 
deepest valley he will lead and though the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me no fate i dread no fate i dread i know i am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid and for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave and to this i hold my sin has been defeated and jesus now and ever is my plea and though the chains are released oh i can sing i am free yet not i but through christ in me with every breath with every breath i long to follow jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, and all the glory evermore to Him. And when the race is complete, still my lips they shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, and to this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, and all the glory ever brought to me. And when the peace is complete, still my lips they shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's sing when the race, and when the race is complete, Till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. One last time, yet not I, and yet not I, but through Christ in me. In Christ alone, in Christ alone, my hope is found, and He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid crown, and firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Sing together, Christ alone, in Christ alone on flesh and fullness of God in helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness is scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid and here in the death of Christ I live there 
in the crown. There in the crown, his body lay, the light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, and up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am His, and He is mine, and bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no guilt in life. No fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From eyes for scry to final breath, and Jesus commands my destiny. And no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever put me from. No power of hell, and no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. I'm going to close with Ephesians chapter th 3, verses 14 to 21 as our benediction. It's a benediction, so receive this with eyes open. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for worshiping with us today.